our closing panel, and, and if you'll indulge us, we might actually go a little bit past 12. Um, and I apologize. Again, there's, if you need to keep going, there's some coffee in the back. Um, my panel today, uh, to close out, some, some of the people you've heard speak before, but some new ones. Uh, Mike Ochel, the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association. That's our old name, but it's close enough. We're CTIA now, just uh, initials. The Wireless Association. Okay. Uh, and Mark Jacobson, of course, from Loop, will be back with us in just a second. Larry Maggot, who gave the opening uh, presentation. And Jed Rice, who is a, a second time uh, participant in one of our panels. Uh, he's the VP of Marketing, uh, Market Development for Skyhook Wireless. Um, they also have a service called Loki. Um, so, and then Jeremy uh, is back from Helio. So, what we want to do is kind of get into the discussion today on we've really heard a lot this morning about the technical aspects of what's going on. We've looked at the issues and, and implications of location information and kind of uh, social mapping. Then we've, the last panel we looked at kind of the marketplace and the ecosystem of data um, in building uh, uh, some of these issues into the infrastructure. And now we want to say, rubber meets the road, what are the best practices here? How, how do we actually uh, go about uh, implementing best practices that provide maximum comfort, maximum safety, and maximum privacy, and also have robust uh, applications and services. So let me just start off with, with someone who, who uh, has been talked about a lot, actually, as an example um, uh, of a service. Uh, it was in Larry's presentation as well as um, it, it, throughout the panel was talking about Jed Rice's uh, Skyhook Wireless uh, Loki uh, product. Uh, Jed, if you can kind of talk a little bit about uh, you know, the service and, and it, the best practices that you've engaged in and how it's different from the traditional carrier networks that Helio has and, and uh, 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 Loot has. All right, thank you. I just put a candy in my mouth, so sorry. Um, this has been really interesting to listen to because, all right, I'll take it out. Um, one of the things we've heard about is, is how carriers have played such an important role in this whole process. And the reason the carriers play such an important role because the context of location that we've been talking about so far has really come in the form of hardware. And hardware in the sense that uh, somebody at some point had to make a decision to put something on this device like GPS. Or they had to put something into this device that allowed it to communicate with a cellular network that was controlled by an entity. Um, and in kind of the spirit of, of opening the discussion here is, is Skyhook can deliver all of that location technology with just a small piece of software, 75 kilobytes, which is no longer than, no bigger than a text document. It can be delivered to any Wi-Fi enabled device. It can be pushed out, it can be downloaded, it can be pre-installed. So what you're now talking about is this ability to make location awareness absolutely ubiquitous. So it's no longer Verizon Wireless deciding whether or not they're going to put location on the phone and then unlocking it for a service to be able to use it. It is you as an individual. It's a service that operates via the internet. It's basically anybody saying, if I want to deliver something to you or if you want a location enable your own experience, we can now do that. The way that technology works, and Larry kind of gave a, a nice overview of it, is we basically don't, we look at the environment around you in the terms of access points or Wi-Fi access points. Um, we've actually gone out and mapped and scanned and collected all of this massive amount of data. We know where almost 17 million access points are. And we use a bit of software to set your, let your device say, listen for access points nearby, and then do basically triangulation off of that. So we can identify somebody within 20 or 30 meters sitting inside a room like this, which is also something from a performance standpoint other location technologies can't do. So we're in this kind of unique position where we're unregulated, we're unmonitored, we don't belong to this big infrastructure, we can put location anywhere, we can give them a higher level of accuracy than most other solutions can, we can do it under a second. And the only guy that's really paying attention in terms of monitoring us are those of us in the management team at the company. Uh, <laughs> and we're very nice guys. <laughs> Fortunately. We've got like 14 kids among the three of us, so we're very conscious of all these things as parents as well. Um, and so it's interesting for us to come to these things because we're not subject to the same constraints, but we're very, very attentive to them. Uh, we recently announced, as, as Larry also had mentioned, that we have location enabled the 55 million AIM users out there who, if they choose to opt in and download this plugin, can now do social mapping, similar to a loop, um, using their AIM client. 
Um, it was got tremendous attention in the press. I mean, for a small company and even for AIM, uh, it got 275 press mentions, radio, TV, newspapers, everything else. But it only took two or three of them. Um, you know, they say all press is good press. Well, if, if, if your company name is associated with the word pedophile, it's not such good press. And it took two or three small TV stations in very small towns to really do alarmist stories to turn this into a much bigger issue than it was. Um, to the point where those alarmist stories actually were retracted um, based on the facts. Um, so all this comes to this point where if you operate outside of a self-governing or even a regulatory system, I think you actually have higher standards in terms of the best practices you have to apply. You know, the fate of our company and the fate of my kids going to college or not depend on the fact that we do this right. Right. Um, and so there's a whole different level of standards. Well, I can segue, since you mentioned um, uh, regulated industries and, and uh, self-governing bodies, uh, the CTIA uh, is, uh, is, is a prime example of that. Uh, Mike Gottschall, General Counsel. Um, can you talk about, with regard to you know, the regulated, a what, what's the regulated aspect of location information with regard to your, your members, number one, and, and what regulatory steps, self-regulatory steps you've taken to, you know, going forward? Sure. Uh, and as we've heard on uh, earlier panels, uh, there's a legal framework that um, comes both from the Communications Act, uh, the privacy section of uh, Section 222 was amended in 1999. Congressman Markey inserted an amendment to a 911 law uh, that specifically included uh, customer location information as uh, included in the kind of uh, business records and uh, account information that uh, carriers, and uh, it's limited to carriers, are obligated to um, protect under um, the, these privacy rules. We've also heard how the Federal Trade Commission has been expanding uh, its oversight in, into this area as an extension of its historical uh, jurisprudence over unfair trade practices, first going after uh, uh, companies that had published um, a privacy policy and then didn't follow it, basically uh, making the privacy policy part of their contract with their customers. And then once privacy has become established as a uh, fundamental um, means of fair trading to uh, enforce uh, privacy and privacy breaches uh, generally. Uh, we've been involved in this area uh, at least um, since 1999, 2000, when the law was created, we realized that for uh, location-based services to be accepted by the public, privacy concerns had to be addressed and the public had to be satisfied uh, that their uh, location information was going to be within their control. So at that time in, in, in 2000, uh, we created uh, on behalf of the wireless industry, primarily the carriers, but also the applications developers, a set of best practices that were based on the uh, well-established Federal Trade Commission's fair information practices. I'm going to go through them very quickly, but uh, as uh, Mark has mentioned a couple of times, we're now in the process of updating our best practices. I was kind of hoping we were almost ready to share them, but they're not, the ink's not quite dry, so it's a little premature to be talking about our new practices, but they, they, you'll get the sense from our old practices where the new ones are. The interesting thing is when we did our practices, it was to enable the kinds of services that Larry talked about uh, today, although none of us uh, Knew, we knew we weren't smart enough, but none of us could really imagine the range of them. And, and in fact, the um, enthusiasm uh, with social networking for uh, users to self-report and, and disclose their, their own location. We were looking at fleet tracking and other things like, like that, um, uh, as well as some of the, the push services. So uh, what are the, the core elements of the industry's fair location practices. Uh, it requires notice, consent, security and integrity of, of information. We'll talk a little bit about that, how that does touch on the auditing. And then very importantly, technology neutral rules. Because uh, you've already heard earlier today, even among us who uh, have spent a lot of time thinking about these issues, 
it's not always obvious when a company is a carrier subject to Section 222. Uh, MVNOs and certain kinds of resell companies are uh, carriers for some purposes of the Communications Act, but they're not for others. Uh, OnStar happens to uh, be a, um, you know, a, a service that uh, is, provides location-based service, but it's done through a subsidiary of General Motors. We have services that we've been talking about that don't touch a carrier beyond they're within the user's control and application control, but not the, the carrier's control. We were concerned, going back to the, the first premise, that if uh, customers couldn't be sure that they could control how their location information was being used and accessed, they wouldn't adopt the service. We didn't want consumers to have to parse through and navigate whether or not they're dealing with a carrier or some other kind of company. Uh, t and having different expectations for privacy rules depending on where the location service was uh, being configured and, and provided. So we came up with a set of, of best practices that we thought would be broad enough uh, and technology neutral uh, to apply across um, all of these services. We then, in uh, the fall of 2000, went to the FCC and petitioned the FCC to adopt uh, location best practices for um, wireless uh, as part of their implementation of the uh, 99 amendments to Section 222. And a year and a half later, after getting comments on our petition, uh, interestingly, the FCC uh, denied our petition and declined to adopt uh, these, the proposed practices. We didn't reject them. They basically said that uh, under the statute, no further action was mandated by the FCC. And Mike, if I can add, uh, we, on our resources page, on, uh, I, I've posted the petition, I've posted um, the FCC response, and I've also posted a few legal briefs on the subject. And I apologize, I've misquoted because I said um, uh, the link to an FCC rejection of the CTIA petition. So um, I didn't mean to mischaracterize that. No, but <laughs> I think that's <laughs> pretty close. Apologies to anybody for the FCC. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Um, do you think that at that time, obviously I, if you made the petition, you, shut, you thought they should have acted on it at the time. In hindsight, with being 2020, um, was that a good thing? Or, was, or, or do you think that we should have had some rules back then applying all, all location information services being treated equally? Um, or more, more clarity about what opt-in means and what notice means? Well, so far it's been fine, uh, but uh, we all stay up at night um, worrying about, uh, you know, the next headline. And uh, we are a, a responsible, mature industry that has been very, very sensitive to privacy interests uh, historically. And those that have entered this space who just don't happen to be, uh, to happen to have a, a, a license issued by the FCC, have also been very responsible, and they too have recognized uh, both the risks and benefits of, of this technology. It's powerful stuff, and what it will take to get consumers to, to accept it. Uh, but I think we all have a feeling that uh, we're operating a little bit without a, a safety net, and that um, having basic uh, rules of the road that um, are premised on well-established best practices, the principles that the FCC, FTC has, has developed over the years as applied to, to this area, uh, would, would serve everyone's interest. So with regard to lack of a, if we don't, don't necessarily have a safety net per se, um, at least for um, services that are outside the carrier's network, without the, with outside the CTA's self-governing process, um, which I guess, you know, Skyhook Wireless Loki is, but obviously um, they're, they're acting responsibly. Can I ask the panel, with regard to lying awake at night, how long do we have, how long can we survive without this uh, safety net before um, we have services that are out there that somehow are outside of a self-regulating self body, outside of FCC, CP&I rules, um, where it becomes the Wild West. And will we ever get to that point? Well, uh, 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 Jeremy, Rich, Ed, Mark? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize that Skyhook was 100% software and a very thin software application as it is. Um, that, you know, 
to me, I think we're probably pretty darn close to that yeah. point. Um, you know, and, and given the global nature of the internet, some people aren't going to be regulated who are going to be able to s provide applications that can perform location services similar to Skyhook. Now you're going to have to have the drive tests and all those other things done to be able to, to locate it. But if you somehow integrate with Skyhook or have Skyhook as a back end and you're an application provider outside the U.S., you know, unfortunately I think we're there. I mean, I think we need some kind of governing body, but I don't even know if you can control it. I don't know how you control uh, a situation where you have somebody in China putting up an application that locates you. I, I think it emphasizes, um, to a point Anne made earlier, the role, and several other people have made, the role of education here. I mean, I mean ultimately, the genie is sort of out of the, is already out of the bottle, and the demand is going to be tremendous. I and mean, we launched five months ago on one tiny little MVNO, well, not MVNO, but the Sprint Nextel Youth brand only has four million customers. We have 150,000 people signed up already, um, and that's tiny, tiny, tiny portion of the U.S. market that we have access to. And there's, I mean, literally, you do the math, there will be tens of millions of people using services like this within 24 months. I promise you. Yeah. It, that, that's right, and if, if, if folks build services where they give their customers enough rope to hang themselves, they, they well, will. So, I, yeah. I think we could take a little bit of comfort if we look at the fixed Internet social networking realm, where you had, for example, MySpace emerge two years ago kind of as a Wild West company, which in order for it to succeed, it had to rein itself in, which is why they hired a safety czar, and in fact is, in my opinion, a, a, a pretty good example of a company that is doing everything that it can, can think of doing in terms of assuring uh, privacy and security. At the same time, you've got probably hundreds, if not of thousands, of uh, folks out around the world creating social networking sites that have no safety consciousness at all, or very little. Yet, despite that, everything we're looking at in terms of recent data from Pew and, and other studies and the, uh, uh, the folks up in New Hampshire, the Crimes Against Children Research Center, is showing that, that safety is actually on the increase, that kids, that people in general and teenagers in specific are actually getting smarter about it. So um, I think it, it sort of goes along with, with what uh, with Dempsey said, you know, that, that ultimately, uh, you know, if you have data, the government can get it. If you have a technology, a bad guy can use it. Uh, so yeah, it's true, we have tons of predators, uh, predators out there, according to NBC, uh, yet we have relatively few victims. Uh, we're going to have uh, companies emerging, uh, uh, companies like Skyhook without the social responsibility. We're going to have predators seizing on this technology. Yet, if people are smart in how they use it, if they understand where the off button is, where the controls are, then the problems are going to be minimal and we will get to the point, ultimately, perhaps not right away, we will probably have cases where people are, are going to become unwitting victims. But ultimately, we'll get to the point where we are with social networks, where virtually all the victims are people who are using incredibly bad judgment. In other words, high-risk people who are kind of going out of their way to do stupid things. Now, we'll never be able to stop that completely, but through education, we can at least minimize that. So okay. I, I do want to add to that point because, you know, it's, it's, we've heard it referenced a couple of times. Both of us have said it. We're parents. It'd be very interesting to actually have a 19-year-old up here to give their perspective. <laughs> My boss is... <laughs> um, well, <laughs> actually, yeah, he was 19 when he founded the company. He turned 22 on Sunday. <laughs> but we did, we did a lot of focus groups before we even launched anything around location. And, and we talked to a, a vast array of demographic groups. And we looked at, you know, what do they do from social networking? How do they use maps, et cetera? And there was one group uh, it, that across the board was completely opposed to sharing their location. And it was the 18 to 21 year olds. Now, not in the context of within a confined environment like a loot um, or even a buddy list with AIM, but these folks all had MySpace and AIM pages and they had put up everything half nude, drunken photos at a frat party. The last line of defense they had was their physical location, and they adamantly were, they just said, we're not going to share location because that's the only thing that I'm not going to put up there. And so it goes to the point that. They were educated. They're not us. They didn't grow up in a particular way. They grew up in the era of MySpace and Facebook and everything else where they're now starting to get educated and self-govern. I have an eight-year-old son who has this Webkins thing 
where he's chatting with strangers, but he's got five messages he can send back and forth with kids. You know, do you want to come over to my Webkin's house and play? And so there's controls in there, and he's also very educated about what he can do and what he can't do. Okay, well, so some of that's going to happen naturally as, as society progresses as well. Since I have such little time, and I do want to get to questions and comments, um, let me just, one of the issues um, is notice, and which follows from that, consent. We had talked a lot about, throughout the different panels, on what type of notice you give uh, and what the consent is. And, and Mike, I think you were getting to the point that um, consent for, for CTIA and, and the carriers will naturally be express consent. Yeah. Well, it is by, by the terms of uh, Section 222. Uh, that's right. Uh, we recognize, though, that the best way of, of handling consent under the uh, Act, though, is uh, through a lot of flexibility, because we're all learning and, and evolving as to what's the best way to communicate, and frankly, consent for a social networking site uh, can and should be very different than what a fleet manager uh, provides to uh, track uh, all the drivers uh, who are working for a company doing um, you know, parcel pickup and, and, and delivery. So uh, with notice, the, the, the rule needs to be that location service providers must inform customers about the specific location information <laughs> practices before location information is, is collected and, and, and disclosed. Uh, if you follow that basic principle, you will have provided meaningful notice. With, with respect to consent and the express authorization, uh, it can be written, it can be oral, it can be in electronic format and re, you know, replying to a double opt-in text message, what, whatever, or, uh, or even you know, other forms that somehow don't fit into that animal uh, or, or mineral or vegetable category, of <laughs> written, oral, or, or electronic. But uh, however express authorization is, is provided, the statute provides a definition. Has to be it has to manifestly evidence the customer's desire to participate in the location service or transaction. It's a pretty clear rule. Now, well, it, it's a clear rule. Um, and uh, the, qu the question I have is, and for Professor Sada, and, and others, um, uh, Jeremy was talking about having a, a notice that's, that forces the issue. Um, well, the, the statute is clear. I think with regard to getting, giving notice and g having informed consent um, is, is, a different, is it a different type of thing. And who, where does the notice come from? Is it when you sign up at the singular store and you, have your, you sign your, your contract? In Jed's case, is it when you sign up online and download the app? Um, that goes that plugs into your AIM service, and, and or does it come on the screen like on the loop loop screen or the Helio screen? Um, and then the other question is, in, when it does come up on these screens and in your face, um, forcing the issue um, opt in, do we condition people to just say okay, 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 um, or is the devil going to be in the details? And I'd really like, with regard to notice in a variety of different venues, whether the statute can be clear. But what actually maximizes comprehension and, and true consent? Well, it, it, I think it's a really interesting question. We've had this debate actually within the CTIA working group on, on location services, best practices. We've had a debate about, okay, what is in fact the best way to provide notice for consumers? And I think right now it's an open question because, frankly, they haven't been around for long enough. And, and I think where probably the trade organization will fall down is, is we'll say, you must notify the customer and here are a few different ways you could do it but they're suggestions and not the only way to do it some of the different ways we've heard about just to get to some practical things that we think are are very helpful one is the helio method where essentially a customer um, has to say yes every single time a location um, dip occurs I, yes i want to give up my location um, a, another way to do it um, is you consent to a service when you sign up for it but then there's sort of clear and conspicuous reminders throughout the course of the life of using that service and there's things done to prevent unwitting use and and the the biggest concern we have and i bet it's the biggest concern that most other folks in our space have is is unwitting use somebody putting a service on somebody's phone without their knowledge 
and, and there's a number of things that can be done to prevent that. The most important of which, when we're going to be launching with uh, one of the Tier 1 operators here in the next six or seven weeks, they're opening up an API to us that has never been opened up to a third-party provider before. That API will let us check somebody's PIN code to see that they really are the owner of that handset. So if I'm jealous boyfriend and I steal my girlfriend's phone and I try to put the service onto her phone, I cannot activate that unless I have the PIN code associated with that phone. Um, th that is uh, one very, very good way to prevent somebody from, from uh, starting a service on somebody else's handset. Another way, and this was this came from the UK actually, um, was to send SMSs at unpredictable times um, to somebody's hands and telling them that the location services are on their phone. So I think all of these things are, are, are good ways to try to solve the problem. But frankly, it's early. Um, and I think there will probably be um, other ideas that people come up with. It, it, the one thing I would say is, for now, we all need to be overly cautious. Um, consumers don't know enough yet, and so if anything, we need to err on the side of caution. I, it, it occurred to me, actually, so far today, I've heard zero cell phones ring, and we never had anybody um, get up here and say, please remember to turn off your cell phones, because we've all been carrying cell phones now for long enough that probably, you know, when you walk into a meeting, you should turn off the ringer on your cell phone, whereas five, six, eight years ago, when cell phones were relatively new for most people to be carrying around, you had to, hit, there was an extra reminder. Well, um, and, and, I, and I think that five years from now, some of the precautions that we're taking may not be necessary because consumers will be relatively educated, but they're not today. Um, Jed and then Jeremy on, on notice, how do, you, how do you give, at least on, on, on Loki's service, how do, you, how do you give notice in a meaningful way that's not, bur that not buried or, or within a lot of different data? And how do you split out notice, whether it's um, sharing information with peers um, and what the implications of that are, and, or sharing information with third-party uh, corporations and, and things like that? So, so the first thing is, 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 is a kind of a fundamental location technology as opposed to an application like an AIM or a loop. We, we power a whole bunch of location-based services and applications. So some of them don't require a notice because it's a completely user-defined experience. It's not shared with anybody else. It's all just something that occurs on your device alone, com away from any network. But what we're talking about here is really the highest level of standard, and that is if my location can be shared with other human beings who have the potential to be able to identify where I am. And a great example of that is the AIM service. There's a triple opt-in when you actually go to download the plugin, triple or quadruple. Um, and then every time a location fix hurt occurs, it is there are two windows that pop up to remind you of that, and you can actually elect which level of location you can set. So either something that, you know, we can deliver a street address level definition, but there's another level which give you a city state. Um, so all those occur through the process. And so I think first of all, I have to look at the application, the use case, and what part of the environment that location has the potential to be shared with, and then you have to constantly be reminding them. The idea of pervasive and always reminding, I think, is for this kind of application, it has to be periodic through the time that you're actually using it as a reminder. Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we take a very similar approach. It depends on the application we're talking about. Um, you know, like I said, we provide Google Maps that is really user trying to find information of pizza restaurants in the area or directions there and, you know, integrated with traffic or whatever. Um, that, you know, is, is much different level than sharing information. So, um, again, because we are so, uh, and our whole brand is about kind of the social networking and connection with friends, you know, we feel the added layer of having to affirmatively say, okay, each time somebody wants to update your location as opposed to tracking that little dot um, uh, gives us enough comfort. It's an it's a in-your-face reminder every time uh, to make sure that, you know, we protect adequately. And that's, that's our take. And again, I think um, Mark hit the nail on the head. We're, we're erring on the side of conservatism and we'll figure out where the industry ends up at the end of the day, and, and I think we'll all kind of gravitate to that area, but at this point, uh, we all have our different, you know, I don't have seven screens to go through at the front end. I don't have random SMSs going out, um, but I do have, every time you want to try to get somebody's location, you got to say okay. So there, we build in different protections, and we're, we're kind of evolving to the right way at this point. Okay. And the only thing I want to add to that, that actually is counterintuitive to what all of our our goal is, and that's high user adoption. I right. mean, we all make money based on the data that more people use it. 
And so by putting these barriers in, we're actually sacrificing growth to let, put that level of protection in. So it's, right. it's something that we pay a lot of attention to. And, and you know, I think we were hearing a little bit from Mark about his user stats. Um, we've got 80% of our users using location-based services uh, on a monthly basis. Now, that's not necessarily the tracking solution. That includes the Google Maps, you know, find me directions, find out where I am, that kind of application. But, you know, we have a huge user adoption given the demographic that, you know, are gravitating toward our brand. Well, let me, let me go to questions. Um, and I apologize for taking so long. But one thing that I, I hope we can get to at some point is we do want to talk about the parent-child um, situation. Um, and also one thing that has to be asked and, or at least discussed is um, age verification. I waited for uh, Adam Thayer to return before we, uh, we, we got to that issue. Um, you know, the question, is, the question also, you know, can, at what age can, can youth uh, opt in uh, and consent to um, having a friend locate them? And how do you define friend? Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, you, what, how do you define friend is a, is a good question. So question, let me go to questions and hopefully we can get to the other ones. Uh, anybody have any, back, ma'am? So we've kind of um, talked around this a little bit through the various sessions, but we as product and service providers are very conscientious about the consent and preferences and we put those mechanisms in place. Um, we talked earlier about how much those are truly understood. Um, our company has really worked hard at trying the, the education approach, but then we're in a situation like the user agreements and privacy policies where people don't really want to take the time to become educated and they just skip right over that. So I struggle with um, who is the educator of what these preferences mean? You know, is it PSAs, is it advocacy groups, is it organizations such as CTIA? Yes, yes, yes. I think yeah. they, they, it, we need as many different voices uh, as, as possible. I think that one thing that came out of all of the press coverage around MySpace over the last couple of years was all of those things. I mean, the media actually, when they weren't, uh, you know, brewing, fanning the flames of hysteria, were actually passing on some of the safety tips. But clearly, there are a lot of organizations out there, ranging from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, PTA, our own ConnectSafely.org, uh, the, the work the Tim's organization, that are out there putting out messages and. Frankly, very few of us are putting out any messages regarding this yet, but clearly the time has come that we need to do that. I would add that your own marketing is a form of education too, because the great divide now, the digital divide in effect, is responsible companies versus irresponsible companies. So um, marketing education, you know, sort of spelling out how we do safety is a really smart way to educate the consumer because parents going forward are not going to want their kids to sign up to irresponsible services. Can I just add one thing? I just came back from a MySpace and I think I can say this without violating any privacy things. They actually sometimes send their safety people out on sales calls and, and that is becoming for them a, a sales technique because obviously they're only going to stay in business as long as they get advertising revenue. I don't know if I don't know how much advertising revenue plays to any of these services, but clearly a Procter and Gamble or a Coca-Cola does not want to associate its brand with anything that's perceived as dangerous, and so it, it becomes, as Ann points out, part of your your marketing and sales. Right, and I, and I also add to that point that it does take time for the the key private or the key protective uh, safety strategy or tip to really boil down. Um, eventually you'll get to the point where uh, the tip is this and it has to be something very simple very straightforward and it seems like the best practices are developing such that hopefully you'll be able to have an expression and that will uh, it, it allow users to act on it um, yeah and if you know we're most concerned I think for good reason on the social networking and and kids who may not be as sophisticated as uh, you know adult or, or or business users but uh, in a funny way, there's um, a, uh, a tipping uh, factor at, at work where if you have some parents uh, who are paying uh, attention and policing their kids and where their kids go, uh, that is going to force all the other kids who want to communicate in that network to those same spots. 
So, um, you know, this is sort of a, a, a good area where, where good practices will actually be, be amplified and, and, and reinforced, uh, unlike other examples which sometimes are characterized as a race to the bottom. Um, David George from Microsoft. Hi, all. Uh, so one comment and one question. Uh, so the comment to Larry, so Larry, what you just uh, mentioned on your point about um, utilizing your safety message as a potential sales message resonates well. We do the same thing, and we think it's very powerful. At the same time, uh, from an advertising standpoint, uh, you have to start off your core with your core demographic. Uh, uh, okay, core demographic actually signing up, so the advertisers are interested in utilizing your service in the first place. So that is uh, somewhat of a. It's some of a slippery slope to be able to actually uh, quantify what your loss rates are. And this actually leads into my question. Jed, you mentioned that, you know, potentially there's a challenge between signing up users and having safety on the front end, uh, which I think we all feel kind of, you know, at gut level, yeah, it would be that way, right? Have you guys quantified that at all? Have you guys found a way to quantify your loss rate for signups versus safety on the front end? Or is it more of a gut, gut check? Well, I mean, it, it Part of it is just by doing some, it's hard because we, everything we do is, is actually very anonymous from our standpoint. So even though we power the location for AIM, all we know is that a AIM user has requested a location. We have no idea who it is. That's all filtered to us. And so a lot of those controls are in place also keep us from doing the kind of benchmark testing we'd want to do as an application or a service provider. So it's, it's generally gut when you say, you know, three screens, you see 60% um, adoption, but 20% fall off as you as you do go through a install process. So it's we have to basically use um, general metrics at this point. Yeah, we we actually have hard statistics. So we've got a 150,000 people signed up and using the service, and our breakage rate from the time somebody starts the sign up process to when they actually complete the sign up process. And let me tell you, you've never seen a more onerous sign up process <laughs> in your life. Um, and mm -hmm. not only seven different consents, but you can't just hit I accept, you actually have to scroll through these things. Um, in any case, uh, it's under 15%. The, what's, what's the main demographic? The main demographic, so it's Boost Mobile is the one operator we're launched with, and they are 19, 20 year old kids. I mean, it's it's ur it's urban prepaid, so it's you know their their demographic is like 14 to 30, and probably the mean age for kids signing up is 20, 21, 22. So young. I think that's an interesting point. One of the uh, point, one of the points earlier is that the people who are signing up or among that amongst that age range on MySpace. If you say that you've done you know the research is out there and they don't want to give their location, then it seems like that would be right. Well, they don't, they, I think they don't want to give their location except in very controlled, except in, in, controlled very, in a very controlled environment. So, so two, other, two other things I should mention to that point. And Tim mentioned earlier it's going to take some time for the education to disseminate. It, it seems essential then that we use the best proxies that people do already understand. So an example of that is you can't invite somebody into the loop service unless you already know their phone number. So I can't go out onto the net and, and try it and onto the loop site and search around until I find, oh, she's cute, and try to invite her into the service the way you can with traditional social networks. Now, phone number isn't perfect because there are kids who will stick their phone number up in their MySpace page, and, and that is unfortunate. But kids from the time they're three years old are, are taught that your phone number is something that's relatively private, and, and in fact, Nokia's got commercials where sharing your phone number is seen as extremely private. And, and so the, the best things that we can do in addition to trying to educate the market is to use proxies that already exist in the marketplace that consumers understand, and I think that's one of them. I, I guess I totally agree with you, and I uh, actually agree with that point. I, I thought that there was a little bit of a, a aha moment there just looking at that particular demographic of the probably 17 to 21 year olds being very educated in this space and not minding going through that onerous sign up period because they understand the challenges, which means that the marketing that will effectually be done won't be probably to that demographic, it will be to the parents yeah. of those children. Remember what happened right? in Face when Facebook had a service that put out too much information, uh, there was this mass uh, protest among college students and who would have thunk it that college students would actually protest the invasion of their own privacy and it was, it was a great lesson for all of us.
Colin? You know, it's a lesson we have to keep relearning. Fifteen years ago, the FCC, with the best of intentions, uh, promulgated rules about caller ID and passing them without thinking that there, uh, there would be consequences unless users could control whether or not their caller ID was made available. There are all kinds of legitimate reasons why people may not want to pass their, their caller ID. So that led to a series of revised rules and, and, and rulemakings uh, and a sensitivity that, uh, as, as Patrick was talking about from Nina, that uh, in a wired context, uh, your phone number uh, does translate to uh, location. And it's not just 911 dispatchers that have access to those databases. Anyone now with internet access has access to, to that information. Um, more questions? I have Heidi, Sailor. Yeah, I have a quick one. Um, to follow up on your point, Tim, about age verification, um, I think that is a very interesting topic that we haven't had a lot of time to talk about today. But I know one of the concerns of the industry or various industry groups is that um, there are not any foolproof age verification mechanisms that exist today. And I think there was hope at one point that there would be and there really isn't. You know, I mean, you've got the credit card mechanism, for example, requiring a parent to use a credit card, um, which, you know, a lot of companies do. But I'd like to hear, I'm just curious to hear from, from Larry and, and a couple of other people up there about where you see that headed and where you think that fits into the best practices. Yeah, well, let me just, let's start off um, before we go there with establishing, what, Heidi, what you said earlier about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Yes, which we were supposed to talk about this morning, but we ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> which essentially, the Federal Trade Commission uh, statute, a congressional act, um, that says uh, you can't collect information, personal information, from uh, children under 13. Um, so that's the, that's the baseline. A lot of social networking sites um, won't allow services for uh, under 14. Um, and I guess the question is, um, uh, based on that, uh, is there a, is there a, do we need to start paying attention to age? Um, certainly you wouldn't be able to launch any of these services for, because of, I would think COPPA would apply uh, to anyone th under 13. But are there, are there ages where we need to be more protective and then age verification or some type of parental consent comes in like the COPPA statute? I think this is a little different than fixed-based social networking. I actually think there are reasons other than the fact that age verification doesn't work why we should question whether we should put it in in terms of uh, kids needing protection in some cases against their own parents uh, and having to have access to social networking. I think with location-based services, though, it begins to become a, a, a more complicated issue. Number one, with the exception of prepaid systems, most kids are getting uh, services where they are signed up and they have to sign up through their parents. And so number one, for the majority of people I think are going to be using these services, once we get beyond Boost, it is going to be uh, through parental involvement. Now when you start getting into the Wi-Fi area, then all bets are off. Uh, I know as a parent that I would have very strong concerns, much stronger concerns about my 15 or 16 year old uh, disclosing her location than I would about her going off on MySpace putting up the silly photographs. So I, I do think we need to think about this. Uh, uh, our general attitude is that your point earlier is that there, has, there are no age verification methods that, that are really foolproof and we haven't seen any either and what we decided was we weren't going to launch a service unless we thought it was safe for a 14 year old to use it and, and that, that the predation problem which is a very 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 real problem unless we could solve that um, we, we were not going to be comfortable with the service even if there had been age verification and, and so you have to put the emphasis on a variety of other things to, to keep minors safe things like no anonymity in the system closed networks no open browsing um, you know prevention of unwitting use if you don't have those things in place and you're relying on on 16 year old to being able to prevent a 16 year old from using something that they want to use I mean for I mean we were all 16 once um, uh, you know you will find a way around so you you I mean Age verification to the extent that there are ever open systems, if somebody wants to do location-based dating or things along those lines, yeah, absolutely. But I, I think the baseline has to be this better be safe for a teenager or you shouldn't be launching it at all. Hmm. Um, Ma'am, Susanna? Uh, yeah, and what age do you think you should be able to opt in for a kid? I, I guess the fundamental question is, 
Um, is there an age demographic at which you shouldn't be allowed, no matter what protections you build in, is there an age at which a, a child cannot simply consent to being located by a peer, a friend, a buddy? And, and that's a good question. Well, certainly the law says that um, um, consent is provided for 911 calls. I think, again, it, it, there's a context here. If I'm a brand new driver and I've pulled over, I'm not using my phone while I'm driving at 16 in one month, but I need directions and I want to get driving directions, I have to consent to give my location in order to get a reply to get to the destination because I'm a new driver and my mom or dad have been driving me and never paid attention how to get from here to there. Uh, that kind of consent is a different kind of consent for some of the the uh, other kinds of social networking, location-based services we're, we're talking about. So again, they, I think that some flexibility has to be um, incorporated into um, you know, the kinds of, of rules and practices we're talking about. The, the place, I mean, the dividing line that seems to have started to take hold in the industry, and this is fairly new, is somewhere between under 12, you're a kid, and that's where the kid tracking stuff um, uh, comes in. In fact, where with child trackers, there is no consent sometimes. I mean, this is very interesting, um, you know, privacy. Like employees. Pri yeah, well, it, it, interesting privacy issue there as to whether or not a 10 year old has to give permission to, to mom to share a location with mom. And yeah, I, I don't know that we have time to address that one here, but, but uh, I'm sure Jim Dempsey has some, some thoughts on that one. <laughs> um, uh, but at least for us, and, and I suspect it's probably true for Helio too. Uh, the, the COPPA rules give a, a nice floor that we actually try to sit above by a year. So we basically start at 14 and, and figure that if you're under 14, there's probably, there, the way your social life is constructed, there's probably not a good reason for you to be using a service like this. Um, and, and it's more, more common sense than it is driven by particular uh, regulatory or, or legislative action at this and point. We, we also, um, our service isn't prepaid. I mean, you have to shell out some real money to be able to uh, use our service. The devices themselves cost more. Um, and we have pretty rigorous credit policies. So, you know, typically the 14 and unders aren't going to have the built-up credit to be able to uh, sign up for our service without paying some hefty uh, either fees or deposits. Fair enough, fair enough. But, you know, we, are, we did imagine uh, at the beginning of this panel and all throughout the day that we would maybe get to this place where it would be the Wild West. And a lot of people indicated that contextual or location-based advertising uh, would basically cut those strings of uh, a service plan and all those other trappings that we seem to be leaning on here. Um, and I, I imagine that future. Is there an age um, that a child should not, a youth should not be allowed to consent to being friend-finded? And, and I have to point out the obvious, and I'm not one way or the other on this legislation. Um, some attorney generals, there's state legislation that says that uh, anyone under 16 uh, should not be allowed on a social networking site. Um, and we've also talked on this panel that location information about that person is, is, is far more sensitive right. than just where their MySpace page is. But how easy is it? I mean, the, the question is how easy is it to fake your age? I mean, you can never, I mean, that's why these, it's, it, they're not foolproof. You can, you know, you can say you, born, you were born in 1965 and you're really 10 years old. Yeah. So you can't, it's, it's you know, there's, so, there's only so many layers and, and with, um, you can establish thin files in credits with credit scoring and all that other stuff, but the, you know, credit, I mean, social security numbers and things like that are fairly easily available. They can fake those too, or they get mom and dads. And so, I, you know, the problem is, is you can say, and we can have this, you know, paternalistic, maternalistic idea or ideal that, hey, no 16-year-olds can do this. But you're, I mean, in terms of reality, right? You know, there's a there's a dichotomy. Yeah, the the reality is, for example, MySpace got much safer much safer after they stopped restricting uh, yeah. you to being over 18. Because what had happened before that is, hmm, strangely, there were six times as many 18-year-olds as there were 19-year-olds or 20-year-olds or 21-year-olds because kids got on and they lied. And, 
And even if it had been more rigorous, they would have figured it out and they would have been, and, and so what they were able to do by saying, okay, minors can use the service, is they made, they made it safer for minors. Uh, I know you're 15, so I'm gonna have certain restrictions on the way that you can use the service and we're gonna restrict the way in which you can share content and data. Um, and uh, um, I, I, I suspect that ultimately for many services like this, the, the best methods are going to be related to accepting that 16 year olds are, are social creatures and they're gonna to wanna to use technologies and every one of them's got a cell phone. And the cell phone, by the way, exposes them to certain dangers. It also makes them safer, both, right? Depending on the context in which it's used. And, and that the, the, the best methods are gonna to be to acknowledge that they are using these services and try to wrap the right rules around the fact that they are. Let me, let me just wrap up with one, question, one more question, and then we'll call it a day. I, I appreciate your forbearance for going in well over the, the allotted time for this. So, Any, any last question? Ma'am? Um, a lot of these services seem to be sustained through advertising dollars and you know I mean with all of the money from search it seems to be going more toward location um, location based services so you know I mean if it's in the business's best interest um, to, to not protect the user's privacy because advertising wants more information uh, then how can these services be trusted to regulate themselves well, let me, let me, I want to draw a distinction here between how you use location for advertising and how you use it in the context of social networking and sharing it with people. It is very possible for a, an advertiser to say to a, a service provider, I want to be able to present ads to somebody in a physical location. And a service provider can present those ads without knowing who that person is that it exists on a blind network. And we do that today, so it's completely anonymous. All we know is that somebody is looking for pizza in a particular location, or an advertiser wants to reach somebody in a particular location, and that advertiser is delivered to that person. That's completely anonymous. In a lot of ways, it, it, it is no different than the direct mail that you receive at home. You know, a direct mail marketer, if you give them your street address, can tell you with an 85% certainty in a 10 house radius, how much money you make, how many kids you have, what your age is and everything else. And so the technology is getting to the point where you'll be able to push advertising to that. That doesn't necessarily mean that that location and that, that identity of that individual is pushed out and shared with anybody else. There's a very, very clear line that can be drawn between the two. That's a great point. And one other point is it, it isn't actually entirely unregulated. I, mean, I think we should keep in mind that location does fall under CPNI, right? Location. It would, in fact, be illegal for somebody to start disclosing locations that they were getting off a cell phone to other people without the explicit permission of that person who is the possessor of, of that handset. Right, but uh, that, it's the location information in your network, in Jeremy's network, and in most of the CTIA members' network, not in Jed's network and maybe future networks that don't use carrier services. Yeah. Yeah. And we haven't really talked about it. I think it's been touched on, but we're moving into an integrated network of, of networks where applications will uh, flow pretty much seamlessly without the user's um, involvement from cell phones to Wi-Fi nodes to wherever they happen to be registered um, on, a, on any network. And uh, you know the, the rules don't necessarily flow as easily as the applications do. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm all for regulation, and I'm all for best practices, but I again remind you, when this conference ends, we're going to walk out the door of this hotel, we're going to be in Washington, D.C., which is a great city, and it's probably no more dangerous than any other city. But most of us are carrying wallets or purses, and there are people out there. There are definitely people out there who, if given the opportunity, will pick your pocket and take your money. But all of us are going to exercise a certain degree of, of caution as we walk through the streets, and probably none of us are going to have our pockets picked today, uh, even though we're out there and we know there are people out there who want our money. And I think that that ultimately, at the end of the day, is the only protection we have, which is a certain amount of critical thinking, a certain amount of self-protection. So getting back to the, the issue of kids, getting back to the issue of all of these things, we have to really focus on education. And I think that's government, that I would much rather see the government first response to, a, to an issue education before they start regulating. 
It is certainly industry. The industry needs to include that. Uh, there ought to be a link to a safety page on all of your websites. There ought to be safety information on your mobile devices. Uh, it, there, it ought to be included in your marketing materials, that it just has to be out there. It's clearly the role of the nonprofit segment, uh, uh, represented by a number of people in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this meeting today, that it's our responsibility to do these things. And I think that with that, uh, more so, or certainly in tandem with regulation and best practices, is what's going to lead to a safer use of this technology. Well, let me, let me just let the, the panelists just say one, one parting comment uh, on best practices. And since we are in Washington, D.C., if you can tie it to that, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I've, I've said what uh, I, I, I'm, I'm proud to represent uh, a responsible industry that from the beginning has recognized the importance of these practices and uh, has been in the forefront of, of getting ahead and trying to stay ahead of such an important issue. And we've recognized our role, and uh, we look forward to um, stepping up to the plate and continuing to be responsible in that way. Uh, in terms of uh, DC, it just occurred to me that the Washington Wizards used to be called the Washington Bullets, which was a, a really poor choice of a name for a, a team, but strangely, um, it took a, an assassination in Israel as opposed to some of the violence that occurs here in our own country to, to, to cause the name change, um, and, and that would be an example in my mind of somebody not being, not being forward-looking. I like that. I, I'm pleased to see so many people here today and the people on this panel, et cetera, who are thinking about the ramifications of location services before something bad has happened. There hasn't been, the, the bad story has not been written, and yet there's a lot of people, many of us who were up at 4 a.m. West Coast time this morning to, uh, to, to start to come to this meeting, I think because we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. I, I made my comment, but I will put in a, a little advertisement. Uh, ConnectSafely.org is there for people to discuss this issue so that after this conference is over, we really invite you to come to the forum. It is a forum and continue this conversation. So, you know, please join us. I think the best practice actually is going to grow like a lot of these other things, and it's going to grow virally, and it's going to grow from a grassroots perspective. We've talked a lot about, about technology best practices and processes best practices and notification and all these other things, which are controlled at an entity level. But as society changes, society is going to create its own best practices. Our kids don't play in the streets because we have created a society where they don't do that. And as they get more educated about both the opportunities and the dangers that present them, society will create its own best practices in how we educate people and how to use these things. I, I, I agree with all the panelists. I mean, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, from, from what Mike said about uh, instituting best practices and making sure that we adhere to them and, and updating and making sure what we're doing, we're, we're you know, following uh, and self-governing uh, has resulted in a pretty good situation we're in right now. Um, you know, if we didn't do that, I, I would be afraid um, of what the possibilities are. Um, so I echo the panel. Well, uh, thanks to everybody that attended. On behalf of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, thanks to uh, Looped, DLA Piper, and ConnectSafely.org. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.